The following is a production of the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. Welcome back to another episode of UFBA Today. I'm your host, Sho. Thank you for being patient as we get back on the air with this program. Uh, it, is, it has been, a honestly, a truly wild month at the uh, UFF Sports Complex, let's call it. Uh, we got the open market finally up and running for baseball. I, I say finally. We did that at the beginning of April, and it has just been a continual water slide of, of fun and uh, busyness, basically, since then. But the open market for baseball, the UFLB itself launching... The UFWBA, which of course is the WNBA counterpart to our beloved UFBA, which we talk about on this program. So a lot of stuff that's been going on in the old world of UFF sports, but it's fun to finally be back here with you on this episode of UFBA today. Uh, I did mention that UFWBA, we will get to some of the logos for that league. Uh, I, have a, I don't have all of them yet, but I do have a bunch of them, and some of them are pretty snazzy. I will say, uh, for the UFBA, really quickly, if you have not seen the logos for the UFBA, I strongly I strongly suggest you go to basketball.uffsports.com and you go to the franchise page. I dare say, and I'm biased because I, I of course, run the uh, the league and, and administer all of the basketball stuff, but I dare say the basketball logos are some of the, the cleanest most creative logos across all of UFF sports. I've seen the hockey logos, I've seen the football logos, and of course I've seen the baseball logos, but I'm biased, they freely admit, but the basketball logos are pretty snazzy. But we'll take a look at the uh, WNBA slash UFWBA logos, at the, or some of them at least, at the end of this program. But of course, uh, here on this show, we like to talk about the UFBA and of course the NBA itself. And since we last spoke, the regular season wrapped up, the playing tournament was held, and now we are off to the conference finals in both the UFBA and the NBA. Just four teams remaining in uh, real life and in our fantasy league. It's funny, right? Because in case you forget, in regular redraft fantasy basketball formats, you might see, I guess the regular C or pardon me, I guess the playoffs in fantasy end when the regular season in real life ends, right? And of course, here at UFF Sports, we aim to mimic things as one-to-one -one as possible with real life and fantasy. So, of course, when the regular season ends in real life, the regular season ends in fantasy. And when regular season, uh, pardon me, when the playoffs start in uh, real life, the playoffs start in fantasy as well, right? So, of course, we had playoff drafts. We had our own a unique take, I would say, on the play-in tournament. It still worked the same way, right? With the, the 7, 8, 9, 10 seeds in their own little mini playing tournament, and then the winners of that tournament go on and become the seven and eight seeds in the one and one through eight playoffs or UFBA playoffs, much like in the NBA. So we got some got some creative stuff going on here, right? So I wanted to start really quickly by we I thought I thought we could take a look back at the the NBA playoffs to date. Of course, I'm recording this in between game one of the Eastern Conference Finals, the uh, Miami Heat beating the Boston Celtics in game one. They take a one nothing series lead. And, or I guess before game one of the Western Conference Finals in the NBA playoffs where the Warriors and the Dallas Mavericks will take on each other. Uh, Steph Curry and Luka Doncic, that's going to be a lot of fun for sure. But I thought we could go back and we could talk about and, and kind of... I don't know if reminisce is the right word, but we could kind of discuss, let's say, uh, the first couple rounds of the NBA playoffs, and then we'll look at the UFBA bracket as well, and some news and notes that have been kind of gone on. I I, I kind of feel bad, uh, real quick off the top, for the Arctic Wolves uh, in the UFBA, because they had, Luka Doncic is their guy, and of course, uh, Luka, if you all remember, unfortunately got injured, I think he got injured in game 82 of the regular season, literally the last game of the NBA's regular season, I think he got injured, he had a calf strain or a, a leg strain or something like that, and he didn't play the first three games of the Mavericks first round matchup against the Utah Jazz, and of course in real life, it, and not that it didn't matter, but the Mavericks were still good enough to beat the Jazz and dispatch and move on to the next round, and here they are in the conference finals, but I will say, uh, not having a major part of your squad in the fantasy playoffs when every point and every bucket and every assist and steal and rebound and whatever, when all that counts, 
It doesn't help if the, if the real life team moves on and your player doesn't play. So I do feel kind of bad for the Arctic Wolves. Although Luka Doncic tearing it up uh, so far in the uh, UFBA playoffs, and I I dare I say you'll probably do the same um, against Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. Let's take a look at some of these standings here. So you can see there uh, the bracket on NBA.com to date. And if we look at some of these series here, I gotta say I think it was. I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's right to say strange. But I do think it was kind of funny that we didn't get a single seven-game series in the entire first round. Like, look at that. The Nets got swept, and I mean, they were the only only team to get swept. And remember, people were like, oh, no, this is not the this is not your older brother's Nets. And I guess it's not, because even with Kyrie and Kevin Durant, I know, I know, the trade with James Harden. Ben Simmons didn't play in the end of the back injury, and maybe he'll play more next year. I don't know, right? But... The, the Nets, I got to say, that was a, maybe if not a surprise, I was surprised they got swept at the very least. They did not surprise they lost. Uh, Milwaukee moving on, not a huge surprise. Miami moving on, not a huge surprise. Eh, the Raptors, I don't know. The Raptors didn't make a series of it after after the first couple games were not particularly competitive. And I mean, you can see just above what, right, right around here, you can see my Raptors hats. So yeah, I'm, I'm based in Toronto. I'm a big Raptors fan. I'll always be a Raptors fan, boy. The championship will keep me warm on the coldest of nights, dare, dare I say. But at the same time, uh, the Raptors were not the better team. And they probably rightfully got dispatched. And just really quickly, Siakam did not elbow Embiid on purpose. It's a basketball play. It happens. They're actually friends in real life. Th that was a really chippy series. I just, I mean, I he he also should have gotten penalized for it. I'm surprised he didn't. But uh, people who are saying he did it on purpose, I think uh, that's a little much. I think. But uh, uh, that, but you know, generally speaking, seeing the Heat, the Sixers, the Bucks, and Celtics all move on from the Eastern Conference playoffs, not a huge surprise. And you look on the other side of things. I don't know that there are really any massive surprises. Like, again, Dallas and Utah with Doncic being out, winning in six games, that's tougher if you're a Jazz fan. But at the same time, that's a 4-5 series. Those things, you know, they go either way, right? They kind of go either way. You look at the Phoenix uh, the Phoenix Suns beating the uh, Pelicans for 2 not super surprising. Denver, I think Denver losing in five games was a surprise to me. Again, not because I thought the Warriors were going to lose, but just because I, th I thought it'd be a little more competitive. But it turns out when you just keep the ball away from Nikola Jokic as much as humanly possible, you can actually win ball games against the Denver Nuggets. Probably helps that there's no MPJ or Jamal Murray, which I'm sure will make things different next year, you think, right? Maybe? Bueller? I don't know. Uh, and then you got the Memphis Grizzlies beating the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. Jam Morant probably is one of the most exciting players in the NBA right now, right? I was talking about this with some friends, but when was the last time you could really say that the best American player in the world is not a top three player or a top four player in the NBA. And again, you can have discussions about if LeBron James is still top 10 player. I think he probably is, even if he's probably in the lower half of the top 10. Uh, where does J Jason Tatum fall? Morant himself, Kevin Durant, of course, as well. But I mean, when you're top, the top four players in some order are Jokic, Embiid, Giannis, and Doncic. And it's pretty remarkable, honestly. And that's not a slight against Americans or North Americans or whatever. I think that's amazing that international, the international level of play has gotten to where it is today. That is absolutely crazy. KD was actually on Twitter. Uh, I guess it was right after, or maybe it was during uh, game one of the Eastern Conference Finals between the Heat and the Celtics. And he was kind of talking about that. If you haven't seen that, I didn't screenshot it or anything, but if you haven't seen that, I, I heartily recommend going to find some of that. Because you know how KD, <laughs> we all make funny his burner accounts and stuff. He actually was replying in like a not dickish way i guess to people or maybe kind of but like you know he was actually having some interesting points and so on and one of them was about how Giannis developed more in america than he ever did overseas and i think there's some validity to that ha having said that i mean how much did luka Doncic develop here versus already being a a formed basketball product before he was drafted anyways i just think that kind of stuff's really fascinating so if you're a basketball fan and if you're watching this i assume you are I uh, dare say you should go look at some of that stuff up on Katie's Twitter. But either way, I just I I think there are a lot of good players in the NBA playoffs. Not all of them moved on, and of course, when they get eliminated in the NBA playoffs, they get eliminated in the UFBA playoffs as well. The player pool shrinks uh, to the teams that are only available in the next round. So if you look at the second round of the playoffs, uh, again, I don't know if there are some major surprises here. I think I think Miami was a good team. 
if not a great team all season. The uh, the Boston Celtics Milwaukee Bucks series, I gotta say, that was one for the ages, right? Much like last year, actually, when we got the uh, I guess it was Bucks Nets in the second round, remember? And uh, KD was probably a, a smaller shoe size away from sending the Bucks home, and in the season they eventually went on to win the championship. Remember, he made that three at the end of either it was end of overtime or the end of regulation, and his toe was on the line, so it was a super long two. And if it was a three, you probably they probably win that game, probably. Anyways, the Bucks Celtics second round series it was a lot of fun, and seeing Giannis and uh, Tatum go back and back and forth basically all series was absolutely remarkable. Although. Giannis not doing a, a huge a hugely impressive job in the second half of Game 7. I remember there was a point at the first half, I mean the first quarter and a half of Game 7, and uh, midway through the second, uh, second quarter, people on Twitter were saying stuff like, oh my god, Giannis, Giannis Antetokounmpo is imposing his will on the state of Massachusetts. And I looked at the score and I'm like, oh, the Celtics are winning by two points or something like that. And then, of course, they turned it up in the second half and it ended being a blowout. I still think if if Chris Middleton is entirely healthy, I, I do think they pro like the Bucks probably win that series. But, hey, the Celtics are playing great. I know they didn't play great against the Heat in Game 1, but they were also missing Al Horford and I believe it was Marcus Smart, right? Marcus Smart with the foot injury and Horford with uh, COVID health and safety protocols. I'm not saying they shouldn't exist, but... It's pretty crazy we're basically in May of 2022 after being in this pandemic for two years. And this is, I'm not saying you shouldn't be dealing with it. It's just a reality that we have to, but it's pretty remarkable that it's still impacting things in a relatively major way, right? And I, and I say remarkable kind of like in tongue in cheek, right? Turn, tongue firmly planted in cheek, I should say. Uh, the rest of those second round series, though, um, some good ones there as well. I can't believe the Phoenix Suns blew, blew things to the Dallas Mavericks. Luka Doncic was cold-blooded in Game 7. There's no doubt about it, but I just, I don't know. What, where do the Suns go from here? They were the best team in the NBA, I feel like, by a wide margin for most of the year. And then Chris Paul completely implode, implodes. You know, people always call him the point god. I mean... I saw some people calling him the point fraud, which seems harsh, but hey, if you get, if the, if you choke like this, that's uh, tough. That's really tough to deal with. And uh, of course, uh, DeAndre Ayton, where do they go from here? I know that is he important enough to this team. He should, you would think, get re-signed. Is he a max player? Eh. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, although if he was ever a Toronto Raptor, I would uh, not complain. But he is an RFA, not a UFA, so... We'll see how contract negotiations go um, now that the Suns have been bounced. And, of course, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and uh, Jordan Poole, apparently. Is he a splash brother now? I guess. I guess so, right? He was fantastic in, in most of my redraft leagues, and he's been fantastic all season long. So, I guess so, right? We'll see when he play, when they play uh, when they play Luka and the, uh, the Mavericks in Game 1 of the Western Conference Finals later today. Um, but of course, we should talk about the UFB playoffs, right? Many of the, many, all of the playoffs I've talked, or players I've talked about so far are actually on UFBA teams. Why don't we go back though, real quick, before we go to the, uh, the, the bracket like this, but for the UFBA, why don't we take a look at the rosters for the couple play-in rounds? I thought that was really interesting. I thought, I thought the play-in round worked pretty well. I gotta say, I, I didn't, I'm not, not that I was, uh, <laughs> what's the right word? It's not that I was not confident that it would work, but it was all done manually via Microsoft Excel, where I just kind of put all everyone's names in and then went to the box scores, inputted the information from the box scores, and then Excel with all the various formulas helped me tally it. And I know many of you guys uh, must have done the same thing, and Excel is a godsend for that kind of stuff. But um, it's nice having fan tracks. Let's just put it that way. It's nice not having to do it manually for every round because that's that would stink. That would stink. There's no way around that, right? But if you look at here and you look at the rosters so what ended up happening so you can see let's why don't we start with the bird conference on the left side of this image here the crusaders against the cosmos and then the hyenas against the mambas so of course like in real life the uh seven seed just has to win one the seven eight matchup just has to win one game and the winner of that matchup moves on to become the seven seed and then the loser of that matchup plays 
the winner of the 9-10 matchup and the winner of that game is the eight seed, right? So what happened basically is that the Cosmos, and Jake did a, a great job drafting, the Cosmos won, they beat the Crusaders, they moved on, they became the seventh seed right away. The Hyenas beat the Mambas, so the Mambas, unfortunately, sorry, Jet, they were uh, they were eliminated uh, right away. So you got Crusaders and Hyenas for round, uh, I guess, round two of the playing tournament. And then in the Magic Conference, the Street Spirits won right away. They beat the Battle Hounds. So uh, Alessandro and those guys moved on to become the seventh seed in the UFBA playoffs. And then the Battle Hounds, as the losers of that matchup, took on the Underdogs. And the Underdogs eliminated the Mustangs, who were moved out right away. And we got Battle Hounds and Underdogs in that matchup. So if you look at... So that's the, those are the rosters for the first play-in tournament, uh, the first round of the play-in tournament. And uh, Trey Young doing just doing doing yeoman's work as they call it, right? He was he was just ridiculous. Uh, and of course, uh, he ended up being drafted by Phil and the Battle Hounds. And so, if you look at this image, you can kind of see the players who are not bolded are the players that stuck on their rosters from round one to round two, and then the bolded players are the players that were drafted essentially, right? So you can see here the underdogs, Frank, uh, drafting a lot of his own players certainly as well, like uh, like Jose Alvarado and so on, but also uh, having to draft a whole or pardon me it's it's the other way around actually it's the players in, in bold are the players you kept and the <laughs> the the other guys are the players that were drafted so that's what i mean frank basically kept his entire team and made two draft picks and then moved on and then uh, you can kind of see here the other matchups as well uh the crusaders did go on to beat the hyenas and the battle hounds did go on to be the underdog so in the end we actually ended up having the seven eight seeds from each team from each conference moving on to the playoffs although i think it ended up being flipped right i think it ended up being the eight seed was the seventh seed and the seventh seed was the eight seed or something like that anyways so that's the playing round and this is this is how the season ended of course of course we can't forget that this is the final standing so teams in red did not make the playoffs teams in green were the top six seeds and then the teams in yellow were the teams as we just saw in the play-in tournament um so that's how things ended now you can of course you can see the spitfire aviators and the bird conference were probably the best team in the conference all season the majesty were kind of always nipping at their heels um as were the arctic wolves but you see here the aviators were, were pretty good for most of the year and then of course in the other conference the midnight owls and the skyhooks went back and forth back and forth gosh all season long and uh, unfortunately for mooch and friends um Things did not go. <laughs> things did not go the Skyhooks' way. Probably because the Skyhooks had a lot of rookies on their team that were either eliminated very early in the playoffs or didn't make the playoffs altogether, um, which is unfortunate. But I guess that's a you know it's a kind of like a pro and con of constructing your roster that way, right? So why don't we take a look at the bracket, the uh, first round bracket? Here it is. So. You can kind of see here. Uh, I made. A, I I opted for a minimalism. I didn't put the the <laughs> the seeds or whatever. I just I like the clean look, right? It's very 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 minimalistic. I love that kind of stuff. Very very uh, very fond of that. Um, not you not that you could tell from my crowded background, but <laughs> but I do like that kind of stuff. And uh, you can see the uh, UFBA trophy, which is currently sitting in a box on the other side of my apartment. So the winner will get that shipped to them directly from me. At my expense, I will ship it directly to you, and you will have your very own trophy as created by Trophy Smack. They are the ones who created, I believe, the, the trophy for the UFBA. HL. Actually, I'm not sure on that one, but I know they created the trophy for the UFAFL, and I know they created the trophy for the UFLB, so they're nice uh, partners of ours, and they made this very snazzy-looking trophy. Michelle, our uh, graphics guru, also coming up with that nice gold version, the playoff version of the UFBA League logo, which is kind of snazzy too, right? So there you go. So you can kind of see how the bracket shook out. So this is round one, and you can see there the bottom right, the Street Spirit sneaking in there, top right, the Battle Hound sneaking in there, Top left, the Crusaders sticking in there against the top-seeded Spitfire Aviators. And then the bottom left, the Cosmos against the Majesty. Now, again, uh, you can kind of see here the Arctic Wolves there in the middle going up against the Lucky 13s. And uh, as, as maybe my preamble kind of might suggest, uh, yeah, the Arctic Wolves did not win, unfortunately. You can see here who did move on. The Ballers moving on to play the Aviators and the Lucky 13s moving on to play the Majesty. The Majesty, honestly, one of the better constructed teams probably all season long. And it's funny to think that at the end, there, like, there weren't that many seeding upsets, dare I say, in the entire UFBA playoffs to date. The only real 
and again, I use the word upset loosely, is the uh, Street Spirits defeating the Skyhooks. But again, the Skyhooks kind of... I don't know if it's... Is it fair to say they limped into the playoffs? Probably not, because they were still pretty strong to end the season. But at the same time, when you have to not draft your whole roster from scratch, but when you do have to kind of, you know, you kind of have to make do... It is, uh, that is tough, right? That is tough. So the Street Spirits did uh, did move on. I will say, I want to point out the Street Spirits for another thing as well. The Spirits did lose Pascal Siakam, who statistically was one of their better players all season long, especially in the second half of the year. Siakam went out in the first round of the NBA playoffs when the Raptors were eliminated, uh, but the, the Spirits still had John Morant. And then in the second round of the actual NBA playoffs, Morant got injured, if you recall, right? He got injured, he had that ankle injury or what have you, and he didn't really play all that much against the Warriors for much of the second round, I want to say. I think he only played in, what, like two games or two and a half games or something like that? Maybe even less, but that the Street Spirits still won while overcoming the uh, injury to... Uh, well, the, the loss of Siakam after the first round and the injury to John Moran, I think it actually is very impressive. So, Alessandro, Luca, congratulations to you guys. That's a, a good job drafting, dare I say. And, uh, yeah, so that's that's how that went. went. And uh, they also drafted, I guess it was DeAndre Ayton in the second round UFBA playoff draft. So, he was a, a big boon. But, of course, Ayton also getting eliminated after the Suns lose to the Dallas Mavericks in seven games, right? So, that's kind of the interesting part of the playoffs, right? The playoffs are almost like their own beast almost right because you just have to make the playoffs and certainly get through the first round but anything can really happen we saw that in the ufafl i know much of you many of you guys are are basketball fans but legion which i would say was is considered by many to be a surprise pick but ross who is uh, one of the heads of sport of course here with uff sports who runs legion uh he did some great drafting and he that propelled him to the title so i think hey good for good for ross and uh good for uh, all the teams that have advanced so that's the second round bracket if we go to the third round, this is where we are right now. So the Spitfire Aviators defeated the Ballers. Majesty defeated the Lucky 13. The Midnight Owls defeated the Hustlers. And the Street Spirits defeated the Bombers. I gotta say, I think three out of four of these matchups were close all of the second round. All of the second round, basically. It was pretty remarkable. Like If you, if you change a couple of rebounds or you change a couple of assists or turnovers and points i think sometimes gets out of hand but you know so like you change some of those secondary scoring the 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 they were so close that i think you could have really pointed to any one of these matchups flipping um especially that that aviators ballers matchup right i mean or uh, yeah that one too but I don't know. It was just, it was very close from beginning to end. And I got to say the, the better teams, I think ultimately did win. And that's not a slight to the teams that were eliminated. They were, it was, it was tough from beginning to end, but I got to say, I do think the, uh, the better teams won. It's funny to think that with the four remaining teams, Midnight Owls, Aviators, and Majesty, the Street Spirits, I'm going to, I'm just going to put those guys, I gave them their, uh, I gave them their applause, right? So I'm just going to put the, the Street Spirits aside for a second. With the Owls, the Aviators, and the Majesty, we essentially have three of the top four teams that were in the UFBA all season. So isn't that kind of what you want to see, right? That is kind of what you want to see when it comes to, when it comes to the playoffs. You want to see best on best. And again, I know the way the the ufba works with the playoff drafting and stuff it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to see the same players that played for them all season long like the midnight owls lost Giannis, right Giannis was you could argue he was the mvp in the real life right so uh they don't have him anymore in the next round but they make do gauge made do with the draft and so on um i have some lists here of uh, here we go of the uh some of the top not of every player on these four remaining teams but certainly of some of the most impactful players on these four remaining teams. So if you look at the Midnight Owls, they have uh, Draymond Green, Steph Curry, Vic Oladipo, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, and I mentioned they lost uh, Giannis. Oh, and Chris Paul. That's right. You're losing Chris Paul as well. Um, if you have a team that has Steph Curry, Green, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, Oladipo too, but you know less so with him. Uh, I feel like you're probably in pretty good shape, uh, especially from certain categories, but um, we'll have to see because they're playing the street spirits. The spirits have, and again, they they have kind of cata continually categorically lost 
some of their best players after every round because those players get eliminated, right? I mentioned Siakam and John Morant and um, and others. And now they have, I would say their top four players in some respects are Al Horford, who was drafted, Kyle Lowry, who is injured right now, uh, Dinwiddie, Kuminga. On Horford, too, I mean, I mentioned it already, but Horford didn't suit up in game one of the uh, Celtics Heat's Eastern Conference Finals. So nothing from Horford. And then on top of that, I think I had read a report from either Shams or Woj that uh, Horford, like the Celtics are preparing for Horford to maybe miss game two as well, still being in health and safety protocol. So not ideal for the Street Spirits, although them winning the play-in tournament or winning a spot out of the play-in tournament and then advancing through the first two rounds, I think is a success no matter how you slice it. But I mean... No one, no one gets to the third round and says, well, we're just happy to be here, right? You want to actually win, but it's going to be, that's, that's uphill sledding, right? <laughs> if you're, if you're the street spirits on the other side, you got majesty and the aviators, and that's going to be a really interesting matchup. The aviators who were one of the top seeded teams all year, they have Butler who had a, just a, a ridiculous performance in game one of the Eastern Conference Finals. The guy had, what, like 41 points? And the thing, too, is I don't think he really had a great first half. Like, he had an okay first half, but he the guy poured in all these points in the second half. He was he was fantastic. And as good as he was in the second half, Jason Tatum was a completely different player in the second half, also a member of the Spitfire Aviators. Uh, he I'll put it this way. I had a point prop on... Uh, I, am, I don't know if I'm a D-Gen gambler. I do like to gamble occasionally. I had a point prop on Jason Tatum for 27 and a half points. Took the over, okay? At the end of the half, Jason Tatum had 21 points. You're laughing, right? You're laughing. You're like Michael Jordan in The Last Dance. You know that gif where he looks at the tablet and he like, kind of like laughs or whatever? I think that was off the Isaiah Thomas stuff, right? Like the back and forth he had. Anyways, whatever. Not important. I digress. Uh... 21 points in the first half for Jason Tatum. You think to yourself, okay, the the, plot, the prop play is 27 and a half. You're for sure going to get there. He ended up with 29 points, <laughs> right? That's crazy. He was a complete, I mean, I know they, they defended him differently. Maybe he was taking worse shots to compensate, whatever. Jason Tatum is a fantastic player and he will be for a long time, if not his whole career. But boy, that almost screwed me. It didn't. So, you know, maybe I should stop complaining, but still. Uh, Jason Tatum, a member of the uh, Spitfire Aviators, Clay Thompson, Jordan Poole, and Duncan Robinson rounding out some of the top players, top names on the Spitfire Aviators. Uh, that's tough, right? Especially if you're a if you're a three, maybe not for Butler, because I don't know how many three point uh, shots this guy's taken. Right, he's really developed the mid range and 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 some of the the right in the paint paint points. But the three point shot for Jimmy Butler is not exactly his forte. Uh, but Jason Tatum, Clay Thompson, Jordan Poole, and Duncan Robinson can all very much shoot the three. So that's probably that category. Dare I say is probably going to go the Spitfire Aviators, if nothing else. But the Majesty have their own tough guys as well. I know they they came into the playoffs with Robert Williams, Time Lord. Um, I forget why that's his nickname. Do you guys remember why that's his nickname? I don't. But either way, Robert Williams is in there. Tyler Harrow, who I have never really liked. I got to say the whole thing. Remember that last year? And he's kind of like the, he did like the, like the kind of that thing. Mm. Cringy. Fine. Personally, find it cringy. But uh, you know what? He is on the team. And of course, the top two players in the Majesty, Luka Doncic, who is on loan from the Arctic Wolves and Bam Adebayo, who is on loan from the Bombers, I think. But, uh, Either way, the Majesty, I think, do have their work cut out for them. Although, if Luka Doncic goes nuclear on the Golden State Warriors like he did on the Phoenix Suns once he came back from injury, dare I say, that would give anyone a fighting chance in the next round of the playoffs. But, uh, hey, you never know, right? It's going to be a fun series either way for both the UFBA and the... NBA. I'm gonna, my prediction is that the higher seeded teams do move on. I think it'll be kind of cool to get the Spitfire Aviators. Isn't that that's like the chalk pick, right? Like <laughs> to pick the two highest seeded teams to win. I know chalk, right? I get it. But uh, based on their roster construction, I dare say they are the slight favorites, the slightest of favorites. But again, the role players will probably have something to say about that. Um, but yeah, there you go. That's kind of a quick look at the UFBA uh, and. Where things stand right now, um, again, I'm very much looking forward to a lot of that. I think as we get further into the playoffs, the UFF Sports has launched this, because um, a lot of you have been asking for betting, right? You want to be able to bet SCO on performance of players for different teams in UFF Sports. Like, certainly, you're betting on the actual players who play in real life, but you're, you can still bet on them 
and uh, and and you know maybe make some sco right. I mean I know Andy over with the AFLL, the American Football Legends League. Uh, he has sco picks based on you know tackles in the second half of the Legends League games between the the Fury and another team or what have you or like who's gonna throw the first touchdown pass the second half and so on right. All that stuff I think is really interesting. So um, I know the uh, UFA, UFHL has done that. I think yesterday they did. Who's going to have more fantasy points between Alexander Barkov and Nikita Kucherov for that matchup between the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning? And I I mean, I'm not so as familiar with hockey as I am with basketball, so I don't know which, U, which UFF sports franchises those two guys belong to. But um, I do know that the, the Lightning won 4-1, so I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that Kucherov uh, did win and not Barkov, so maybe we might do something like that, right? Maybe when we get into the UFBA Finals, who will score more points, Luka, like more fantasy points, Luka Doncic or, I don't know, Jason Tatum. Let's say it's the Mavericks and, and the Celtics in the Finals, right? But either way, I think that'll be, uh, that'll be pretty cool. It would be kind of cool also, now that I say that out loud, it'd be kind of cool to get a rematch of the Heat- Mavericks final with like a new set of players instead of I guess I guess instead of uh well I was gonna, I guess I said it's happened a bunch of times now I guess I was gonna say instead of Dwayne Wade and Dirk or LeBron and company and Dirk I guess you could say it's uh now Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry and Bam Adebayo and of course uh Luca and company right anyways um that'd be kind of fun And uh, either way, whenever we do get further along in the UFBA and NBA playoffs, we will, of course, cover it right here on UFBA today. Before we go, I did want to show you guys some of the logos for the UFWBA, because I got to say, some of them are pretty snazzy. And I believe all, no, maybe not all of these, but most of these logos are from existing UFBA franchise owners. So why don't we go to the first one here? The Diamond Arrows. Look at that one. It's pretty cool. You can kind of see the relation between the Diamond Arrows and the Underdogs, because of course this is uh, the owner of this squad is the owner of the Underdogs, Frank. So Frank, fantastic job. Also, maybe we'll play it when I we do the next episode of UFBA today, but Frank had created this really cool graphic that was like the under the underdogs logo is kind of similar it's like a flaming basketball in a net and it's like cool it like bounces and you can see the dog in the end i don't know it's kind of neat so maybe we'll get frank to make them for all the franchises if you're if you're listening frank uh the next up is the white tails and of course the white tails the sister franchise let's call them of the Redbacks, of course owned by ash jesse and lee and uh, i gotta say when lee showed me this logo kind of creeped me out gotta say didn't love it not i mean it's it's objectively a snazzy logo but just spiders never been a huge creepy crawly guy lee jesse nash are all from australia where i under whereas as i understand it uh spiders are the size of like your car or something so hey good for them for pairing the redbacks with the white tails as i understand it two poisonous species of creepy crawlies so um gross but cool Okay, gross but cool. Uh, this is from the Sparrows, and uh, I, I like this. I like this logo. Very, very like. Again, I said I like minimalism. Very minimalistic, right? Uh, Ross, who I mentioned before, who is of course uh, one of the head of heads of sport for UFF. He runs the horse racing division, and of course is one of the franchise owners and GMs in the UFAFL. Ross, I think he also did the White Tails logo, but he definitely did the Sparrows logo. So great job um, by Ross on that one. I love the minimalism one. This one is from uh, from our pal Sylvia Crawley, who is the owner of the the uh, the Bull City Blazers. I was trying to remember the price of the franchise, but either way, the Blazers were the most expensive uh, UFWBA franchise in a bidding war with Jake of the Cosmos. And uh, the Blazers won out. This is a pretty cool logo as well. The Bull City Blazers. There's actually a couple of versions of this logo. Much like, you know, you have like the main logo and your alternate logo. This is like, I think the main one. But either way, this is this one's pretty cool. I like this like angry looking bull guy that's on fire. And then uh, this one made by our very own Stefan Hoffman, who owns the Renegades, the newest owner of the UFBA. And of course, Stefan has joined me on UFBA Today prior uh, in previous episodes. And you know what? Kudos to Stefan because he told me he made this all on his own. I honestly didn't know Stefan had any kind of graphical uh, creation, graphic design acumen. So uh, you know what, Steph, Steph, man, pal, good for you because that's cool. Also, I'm only now noticing their eyes in this thing. Maybe I'm just tired, but uh, yeah, pretty cool. So 
these are just <laughs> these are just five logos in the UF WBA, and the season began at the beginning of May. I think it was May eighth. It was a Friday, and so we're only a couple of games into the actual season, but. Uh, either way, these are some of the snazzy logos. I do have the logo for the Hardwood Queens, but I'm just waiting to get like a, a like a, a cleaner version of that logo before I show it off. And then we'll get logos for some of the other franchises, the Tropics, the Skunks, and so on moving forward as well. But these are some pretty cool ones. I got to say, if you haven't seen the UFBA logos, I, I really heartily encourage you to go to uh, basketball.uffsports.com. All of those logos are there. And then, of course, all of the UFBA logos are there as well. But yeah, this has been another episode of UFBA Today. I'm glad we got to do this. I'm glad we got to do this again and get back in the saddle, right? It's like riding a bike. You don't really forget, even though, you know, it's been a while. Uh, when we come back the next time, we'll go over the prize pool and see which, uh, which franchises have earned maybe the most SCO and see where things stand as we head into the UFBA finals. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll unbox that, uh, the UFBA trophy. We'll take a, a nice live look at it instead of just looking at the picture on the graphic. And uh, we'll look back at the UFBA as well, or the UFWBA as well, pardon me. And um, I think Daniele Franceschi, our UFBA scouting director, is probably going to join me at some point in the not-too-distant future because, of course, the uh, the draft, the NBA draft is coming at the end of June. And then, uh, of course, after that, the UFBA entry auction will find out who will be the ones, the which, which UFBA franchises will own the likes of Jabari Smith and Chet Holmgren and Paolo Banquero. I think it'll be really fun to see all that stuff. So Daniele will talk to me and you about that on the next episode of UFBA Today. But thank you for being along. Alongside me, we'll talk to you next time.